Thanks for having me. Um, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. I gave a talk last year actually at this Galaxy Information meeting uh, very excitedly about these first ideas we had uh, thinking about uh, numerical simulations of dark matter in what we think quite a new way. Um, and so uh, this year is going to be sort of more of an update of all the things that we've uh, managed to do uh, since then. And so there's a list of papers that are sort of uh, some already accepted, others in preparation. Talk more about the lensing and the velocity power spectrum today, and you'll hear more about the warm dark matter uh, and other aspects from Oliver just afterwards. So <clears throat> I don't need to give much of an introduction here to uh, studying cold dark matter or warm dark matter uh, for this um, audience. What you're all f very familiar with is you looked at plots like this for a long time. Uh, there's a very small simulation, 256 cube particles, um, M body only. Um, with our sort of favorite uh, cosmological initial conditions, a very small box in this case, and you see it's quite nonlinear uh, already. And every time you sort of think about these uh, simulations, you think of it really as a, a system of n bodies interacting. And there, <clears throat> uh, fundamentally, we would have started with more of a continuum description that there's sort of a fluid moving around. But when we discretize these equations, the Vlasov Poisson system, when you discretize that and you assume delta functions in position and velocity space, and you go through the derivation, what comes out is exactly the M body system that you're used to when you simulate um, the gravitational interaction of infinitesimally small bodies. Then, of course, we realized infinitesimally small bodies, that doesn't work out. We, we're still interested in the fluid limit. So what we usually do is we assume that those bodies are not infinitesimally small, but have a particular size. And this usually comes in as a form uh, how we change the gravitational force law. We uh, use Plummer softening. And so if you plot that potential, you can take two derivatives of that. And that gives you the density distribution of the object that your simulation has in mind. Um, uh, that uh, of which it calculates uh, the gravitational interactions of. And so the assumption is if these objects are fluffy enough, um, then in fact I may describe more the fluid limit where it's really the large scale contributions to the force that dominate and it's not local scatterings of these particles in the simulation. In these two uh, simulations, we usually have 10 to the 8 solar masses, in some really good ones, maybe 10 to the 4, or we study very small boxes, even smaller. But of course, those are all, um, you know, we typically have about 10 to the 60 uh, particles too few in the simulation uh, in, in the sense of corresponding to the real uh, limit that we would be interested in, right? And so, <clears throat> so for a very long time, that's how we've been thinking about this. Every time you look at a particle, you say, ah, that is where the mass is. The dis uh, distribution of mass associated with this is what I get from my plumber softening. That's what I uh, put in there. And so when you make a plot, then you just sort of pl uh, put down where all your mass is, i.e. the particle locations. When you sort of look at it, it looks quite noisy. Well, it's because we don't have so many particles everywhere and there's regions where there's low density, there's few particles, it looks very noisy there. <clears throat> um, and so what we've been doing, um, you know, is really think of this quite differently where you still have particles, uh, but now they just trace where the fluid is moving. And we think of the mass not being at the location of the particles, but between the particles. So it's really a volume filling thing. And it's our particles only tell us where is that mass being stretched to. So later when I need to ask, okay, what's the density, i.e. how was the mass distributed? I look at, okay, the particles tell me that it was stretched out this way, so that mass has to go in this region. And that tells me how to assign densities, and now I have densities at every single point in space. And the difference is then, I'll just flip back and forth a little bit, is all of a sudden you don't have a sense of noise at all anymore in this calculation. In fact, everywhere in the voids you have a well-defined density. Um, your filaments really stick out now. You get the sense of a, a very strong cosmic web there. But there is no, no more noise, it's just gone. And the beauty of this is really um, that it's extraordinarily simple, I mean, particularly in hindsight. Uh, but now that we have this realization, it's actually very, very easy to deal with this uh, because all you have to know is uh, when we start our simulations, we put the particles on a grid, we model a uniform density, right? The universe was super uniform early on. We just placed the particles on a regular lattice. And I know how to split up a regular lattice in simplices of that space. So that's just tetrahedra, so I tessellate uh, uh, this very simple uh, uniform grid. 
And I have to do that only for one cubic region. And then, uh, I put six tetrahedra in there. In those six tetrahedra, uh, tetrahedra, so the connectivity where those particles are, that's never going to change in the evolution of the system. So if I look at a later snapshot, I just look, oh, where are those tetrahedra? And I say, oh, it's this big. So I know, ah, the mass that was in here was stretched over this volume. That's my contribution to the density at this point, wherever this tetrahedra over, uh, overlaps my volume. Now I might just have millions of these tetrahedra overlap one particular volume, so I have to make sure to sum up all the contributions, but that's all we have to do. And so it's really by using the initial configuration uh, and the final one you, that you're looking at, understanding this connection that you really just were flowing in phase space from the initial simple configuration to this very complicated looking one at the end, um, is where this new information comes from that tells you what really a density and a velocity at a given location is. And this is um, beautiful because you can see right away that if I have some shearing motion, so if uh, my fluid moves with a particular amount of shear, my elements now, these tetrahedra, will nicely follow the anisotropy of how the mass was dis distributed. All previous ideas of doing density estimation use, for example, a kernel. You do a Gaussian kernel for every particle. Uh, that assumes it's isotropic because you don't have any other information. That's a good, good assumption. But since we know how it was deformed, we don't have to be isotropic. We're anisotropic. And this has this radical difference that in a warm dark matter simulation applied to exactly the same M-body data. If I look at all these filaments, in our technique you have perfect, exact, strong caustics. You see the inner caustics, outer ones, and it's, it's a complete, um, you know, it's a perfect description of what the fluid density is like. If I use um, just the assumption that I'm going to use a symmetric kernel, so in this case adaptive kernel softening, just like you do in a smooth particle hydrodynamics code, just that assumption that it's isotropic introduces artificial features that are incorrect. All these clumping, all these clumps that you see here, they're a pure feature because I made this wrong assumption that my kernel is isotropic. Whereas in reality, things were sheared. Now you can imagine that all our codes, whether we do adaptive softening or we use a tree, that's really what they actually use. We always think of spherical particles that have spherical uh, force laws from them. And it's this artificial clumps that you see here, which then your code will amplify. Because it now thinks, ah, there's more mass here. Potential well is deeper. It'll attract more things. That's the reason, fundamentally, why warm dark matter simulations, when you use too much force resolution, will always lead to artificial fragmentation. We'll hear more about that from uh, Oliver. But it's sort of, <clears throat> I, I just show this here because um, having now kernels, essentially, or uh, the volumes where you distribute your mass, um, be really free and not constrained to some particular assumption you made, allows you to get these perfectly sharp features and really represent the density field accurately. So just very briefly, <clears throat> I said most of this in words already, you just, all you ever have to think about in this is you've got one unit cube, which tessellation of that unit cube am I going to use? And there's multiple choices. Here's one particular one. And in our first paper, we really spell that out exactly of which corners you identify with what. But uh, you get six tetrahedra, you do that once, it's just a list of connectivities, and then that's always replicated throughout your volume. So it's very simple loops that you're used to, looping over particles, that you now have one extra inner loop that has six uh, subcases in there. It's super easy to, to program. Now, um, that's one of my key messages, so I'll keep repeating it throughout the talk. <laughs> The beauty about this though is if I now at a single point in space can measure things like a density, a bulk velocity, I can measure velocity dispersions at a single point because I may have a thousand tetrahedra overlapping this point and I can interpolate the velocities from the vertices of the tetrahedron to the point I'm interested in. But I can do this for the thousand or hundred thousand tetrahedra overlapping this point in three dimensions and I get now the histogram of velocities of dark matter streams passing this point. So at a single point I get this entire um, distribution say of the x component, y component, uh, uh, z component of the velocity or the total one. Uh, extraordinarily useful at every single point, right? Now, that's why we can make uh, infinitesimally thin slices through a simulated cluster in this case, show you the density, see all the beautiful caustics, all the substructure falling in. Um, this is the velocity dispersion um, that you now just 
only in regions, of course, where you have more than one stream do you have a dispersion. In regions where there's only one stream of dark matter flowing, you only have a bulk velocity, there's no, no dispersion. Um, and you see the effects, like some of the substructure, you know, is colder, so it's darker in this region. You also get slightly colder in the very center. Um, much of the shocking, in a way, goes on here. You can identify an entropy-like quantity now because the sigma squared is like a temperature. Um, and so, rather useful. Here, we just uh, drop the number of streams, and you see there's a single stream material falling into the halo from the voids. Um, much more complicated as you go towards the center. This goes up to about 10 to the 5 uh, number of streams. And this one uh, will just not converge. So when we do this for cold dark matter, we just add more particles. The more particles we add, if I have 8 times more particles, I find 8 times more streams in the center here. Um, and the, that's really just a consequence of how complicated the evolution of the dark matter is. This phase space sheet winds up very, very rapidly in the center of halos. And with cold dark matter, of course, it's particularly extreme because it starts at a uh, very high redshift in earth mass sized objects where you already have gravity winding up and sort of mixing up uh, dark matter locally. So that stuff falls in later and you, all you ever do is you add two more folds every time um, you sort of yeah, fold the sheet. You know, just literally like any sort of cloth, every time you fold, you get two more. So you go from one to three to five, you can do uh, as well. So here, perhaps, uh, perhaps just a quick animation of a time evolution uh, of this sort of cosmic web. Again, it's just 256 cubed uh, particles, but the, um, the video already gives you that sense that there's so much more contrast um, that it looks like it's a simulation with much, much more resolution uh, than just this old stuff we could have done in the early 90s, I guess. Anyhow, there's a little bit of a bias then. What happens in the center, I said, you know, we wound up this phase space sheet crazy, and it didn't converge in the center of what the number of streams is. Like, so how many number, or the number of different dark matter streams moving through the center of a halo. It doesn't converge there, and for cold dark matter, we'll never be able to, to calculate this uh, because the range of scales, there's just no way we fit this on a computer today. Um, but what this means uh, in a technical level is our tetrahedra sort of gets stretched out. So you imagine you have two particles that started out at the beginning and they uh, acquire a phase shift as they orbit uh, in, your, in your object and they always get further and further apart. At some point, their distance is as large as their orbit. And now we're not getting new information. We don't actually track of how the mass between those two particles is being spread out. So nice because all we have is those two particles and now they just keep orbiting and I always think the mass is in between those two particles. And that gives us a slight density bias in the center of these objects. And you see this here that the solid lines compared to the dashed lines are always a little bit higher. So the solid lines are our method and the dashed lines is just how you would normally do it counting particles uh, in this spherical volume that you're considering. So you know, um, we have no noise, but we have a bias. And so it's not very big, uh, so here's a comparison. If we do that for a projected image, comparing the density you get with an SPH estimator versus our tetrahedron estimator as a function of the density that the tetrahedron estimator finds. Um, if there were no bias at all, it would be just perfectly uh, straight here, um, you know, at zero, so a ratio of one. Uh, and you see very slight offset. Anyhow, in particular at high densities, you know, this can get sort of avoided 20% or so, okay, or more. Is the, say what? Yeah, 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 sure, exactly. So, I mean, I mean in fact, it's worse. I mean, this log, it goes to 0.3, it's almost two. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, and, but it's interesting, actually, because it, one thing it tells you is that your in-body simulation, which assumes that the mass is at exactly the point where the particle is, um, you cannot trust that a priori. Because what you learn is the tetrahedron, I mean, the volume that this mass would have been stretched over is much, much larger. So what you rely on to get a, co a correct answer is that your time sampling that you have with your particles averages out correctly. And that's, you know, not easy to, to prove directly, um, and we can get back to that perhaps in the question section. But what's interesting is that small correction here, since I can measure it, I can then just use this correction factor, divide it out. 
um, and look, for example, at the density projections I have of uh, one of these simulated clusters, and then do some contours on it. And so uh, clearly, that's our method compared to SPH and CAC. Um, in the one case, we've got uh, cold dark matter down here, warm dark matter up here. And you notice that, in fact, with applying this correction, you have very nice agreement with, with the overall structure, but you have no noise. In the, and this is, was a really big problem in, in some sense for lensing, to make predictions for gravitational lensing, where you ta uh, take the surface density and you turn it into magnification. And you uh, study uh, magnification ratios between images, you want to look at the impact of substructures. You can imagine that this gets very tricky when uh, all your contours are this noisy and you're trying to discern sort of subtle effects of what a small substructure uh, object would do to this contour. And that's why we're really excited that uh, with our technique that noise is just gone and all the deviations in the contours that you get of the magnification are in fact physical. And we can line them up with substructures that we find in the three-dimensional configuration and so that's rather fruitful. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make one more point here. If you want to make these pretty images, at first I only told you that you need to make these six tetrahedra. But then they can get large, in particular if they want to make an image of the simulation on a very, very small scale, I zoom in really far and my tetrahedra might be really big. Uh, there's a very trivial thing to think about, it's just you make it recursive. You take, you, you know, the triangle is the 2D analog, you take the longest side, split it in the middle, and now you have two triangles. Great, and you do this recursively until your triangles are smaller than your pixel, and you've got a trivial algorithm that you can write down super, super easy. Um, you know, find the longest side of a triangle, give me the half point of the triangle, now take this triangle and um, uh, write down two new connectivity lists. This point, this point, this point, this point, this point, this point. Perfect, right? It's a super, super short uh, thing. And all of a sudden you've got a recursive algorithm that just makes, you know, fantastically sharp noise-free images. Um, it's useful, you know? And so for lensing, I think I'm, I'm rather excited about it. There's other applications um, is if you want to do velocities, same thing. Usually you're always in this problem. You want to you know, um, show what, what's the velocity flow in your simulation. It's noisy as heck because you've got a particle here and then you make a 3D grid and then you've got some cells that don't have any particles in it, others have two in it. So okay, the bulk velocity is the average of those two particles. So you can imagine how noisy this gets. And in fact, the very best method that people have discussed so far uh, is what they call DTFE. Um, it really does a Voronoi tessellation on all the particles in order to get sort of a way of interpolating velocities from the points of the particles uh, over sort of a larger volume. But you see that in this image here that it still leads to lots and lots of noise because the Voronoi tessellation doesn't really uh, dissect of what is a bulk flow and what is a dispersion. It really just finds small volumes around every particle and says, oh, whatever the particle's velocity is, that's the whole volume moves like that. But you really have to separate a bulk from the dispersion, right? Because the microphysical dispersion <laughs> it would be made by a huge number of streams, and that's not what you want to measure. And so here's an illustration on very few particles in here. But as a consequence, if you do sort of um, a simple power spectra uh, that in this case on the divergence of the velocity field, this is for a warm dark matter model at three different resolutions. Our method is, gives you exactly the same result uh, independent of resolution. Whereas DTFE will still give you deviations and lead to this uh, Poisson uh, short noise term down here because at small scales you still keep having this dispersion. That's really not the thing that you wanted to measure. So <clears throat> my point here is, you know, it's just sort of nice, it's a very technical thing, but it's a very, very useful thing. Uh, it may sound complicated at first, but it's really, really, really uh, simple. Um, and so there, you know, so a whole bunch of open questions. Uh, one thing I alluded to uh, is what I'm just now confused by is just thinking about how this evolution happens in phase space that I have so much winding and so much phase mixing that goes on over time that I'm trying to sort of sort out, like, how could I be convinced that the, in, uh, you know, the NFW profile that we keep finding robustly and we're totally converged on um, is, is in fact the correct answer? I mean, I totally believe it's the converged answer. It is the correct result, very likely to the problem of having fuzzy balls attract each other. Um, and 
But what I'm not sure yet is whether it really is the answer to the continuum problem in which you could represent phase mixing that's much, much more on a finer scale than our in-body simulations can describe at the moment. And in order to prove that, um, I think, I mean, we're really working very hard on doing uh, refinement in phase space to follow the exact microphysical phase space structure um, of how this fluid, this continuum models. And then, you know, uh, when we finally can do that, uh, sort of with uh, keeping errors in the numerical integration small enough that we still trust uh, the answer, then I think we'll learn whether um, that problem, the full continuum problem, has in fact exactly the same answer than the one we're used to. Um, and then I think I was hoping to give you a whole bunch of examples like how for lensing, and this also applies to weak lensing, not just strong lensing, for velocity statistics, sort of more theoretical things where you're interested in these volume weighted quantities, uh, these type of approaches are, are super useful. You should give it a try. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and so in fact, we've already implemented this twice now um, of doing uh, refinement in phase space. And so this is a particular refinement criteria that you discuss. And the one, uh, in fact, Oliver has worked on a lot is uh, sort of a very simple one uh, we like to use now is you compare the accelerations at the centroid of the tetrahedron with the accelerations at the uh, vertices. And so that gives you a prediction. And then you can use that ratio as an efficient criterion to say, oh, I don't have enough resolution here. I need to split my tetrahedra. And <clears throat> it's just that, you know, just the nature of the problem is you have at least power law growth uh, in the very central regions. And so that's what we're struggling with now is have high enough accuracy to do this because it's a multi-mass technique now. That's the other key thing in some sense. You have now different mass, uh, masses for the elements. So your, uh, your the soft, the softening and the time accuracy you have has to be perfectly matched to not start um, get or, you know deviations or numerical errors building up, and that's why it technically turns out to be actually surprisingly difficult. <clears throat> Yeah, so that, uh, the method of characteristics is great because every particle really moves on its characteristic. You know, this is fantastic. You use the correct acceleration and you're just a tracer. The one thing, though, is what I sort of worry about is that uh, we deposit the entire mass there uh, of the few particles. And so the smaller volume I pick, the more noisy it's going to get uh, of what my estimate there is. And I rely on having enough orbits to always fill this, you know, and not have artificial noise in the forces. Um, and so for the central regions where I take the most time steps and have the fewest particles uh, for really small volumes, you could sort of see how this could go, um, could go wrong. Another way to think about it is actually when you measure it with this or you look at what Mark Vogelsberger did with Simon White, sort of when they follow the uh, sort of local distortion of the phase space sheet, um, the typical volumes that you estimate uh, is a billion times uh, larger then the volume the particle would have if it would have just uniformly expanded with the universe. I mean, it's a huge volume that this mass gets stretched over, enormous. And most of it overlaps. In the simulation, you know, uh, it has to overlap exactly to, to make the embody approach correct. But, you know, there could be so many things, I just can't prove it one way or the other. But the more I look at this stuff, it's just a, wow, different things could happen. Huge, exactly, and that's why we need to do refinement. But then you know you have to get your forces right, and then you have to the time integration becomes actually rather tricky. So this won't be easy, um, but I, I do think it's totally worthwhile. And even in the most boring case, where in fact NFW is the exact answer, also for this limit, not just a discrete limit, it'll still be fantastic to have that uh, phase-based structure, at least for one halo, in absolute perfect glory detail because we can think about annihilation, velocity dispersion, lots of other things. So, I mean, it, it's worthwhile doing it and high risk. Uh,
yeah, yeah. No, there's a little more than that, right? I mean, the warm dark matter problem, for example, when you have more force. But why? No, it's a Seldovich pancake, the same thing. You see collin collisionality very early. It's Oh, I, but I explained why, right? I explained why. explain many times, but if the spice is there, spice is there. Sure, yeah, yeah. It's a mistake if it's 5 percent, even 1 percent, it's not there. It's all everything. That's, that's no good. The, the, for the center of the halo, right? Yeah, fine, but every particle who goes to the center will make a mistake. Uh, so you get, yeah. you get rid of the part. Well, but that's what I'm telling you is that all you, uh, that you understand where this comes from is in fact that you're not tracking the phase space sheet, which is not clear that you do in the regular one correctly. I mean, you know for sure, in but fact. No, not necessarily the voltage. If you start with a sound idealized, then equally in the system, you say, uh, how we can work? There's no voltage difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That has Right. But I mean, you would agree that you can demonstrate very easily very large force errors in the usual M-body method um, when you use more force resolution than mass resolution. Yeah. yeah. But and so oh, everybody does. I mean, all your simulations have softening much smaller than the mean particle separation. No, never get Always. No, no, so we, these are uh, adaptive <laughs> <laughs> and, Right. Anyhow. <laughs> yeah. Okay.